On November 17, 1986, Japan Airlines Flight 1628 took off on an Iceland to Alaska leg of its journey. The Boeing 747 200-foot cargo plane was traveling from Paris, France to Narita Airport near Tokyo. What was supposed to be a routine flight carrying a cargo of bottles of wine turned into a nightmare journey for the captain and his crew. What actually happened to them that evening over the Alaskan skies has been hotly debated over the years. Now, before we begin, we'd like to say a special thank you to this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Chances are you're a fan of top fives and you've probably got a knack for late night investigations in all corners of the internet. Whether it's deep dives into the unknowns of the universe or binging the newest mystery thriller series on your favorite streaming service, you probably spend a good amount of time online. But what if we told you there was a safe way to do so? In addition to an opportunity to access the web from any location in the world, no strings attached. With Surfshark VPN, these incredible possibilities are delivered directly to you in the simplest ways possible, letting you evolve into a top tier internet sleuth. One of Surfshark's greatest keys is its ability to unlock access to servers from anywhere on earth. Whether it be the United States, the United Kingdom, or even East Asia, surf the web in any country in any time zone. This means your favorite television shows and digital programming that's only available in certain territories are now available on your own streaming service accounts like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Just switch servers on the VPN to a country of your choice and entirely new libraries will be at your viewing disposal on an unlimited number of devices too. There's also an additional level of security as well. So if protecting your data and information is a priority, Surfshark VPN uses industry-leading encryption to secure your data keeps your browser history confidential and automatically blocks over a million known virus hosting websites and other phishing threats. It may sound too convenient to be true, but we promise that's just the tip of the iceberg. For a limited time, use our code TOP5s upon checkout to unlock a brilliant 83% discount, along with three months free and a 30-day money-back guarantee, easily the best price on the VPN market. So what are you waiting for? Grab your magnifying glass, shut those Venetian blinds, and become a better sleuth with Surfshark VPN. After staying in Iceland overnight, Captain Kenju Tarashi and his crew were looking forward to their next part of their journey, as it was a short flight of just over six hours from Kafarabic Airport Reykjavik to Anchorage, Alaska. On board and in the cockpit, Tarachi, who is an experienced ex-fighter pilot with more than 10,000 hours of flight experience, was happy with his crew, who were to his right, his flight engineer, Yoshio Sabuka, and to his left, co-pilot, Takanori Tamafuji. Once the plane was out of Canadian airspace, tracking passed from Edmonton Center Air Traffic Control to Anchorage Center in Alaska. The JAL was traveling on autopilot at an altitude of 35,000 feet, and was cruising at an airspeed of 565 miles per hour. Although a bright moon had helped with the visibility over Greenland, there had been some slight turbulence. Now the crew were experiencing a smooth flight, but the moon was behind them and the sky up ahead was dark. Anchorage Air Traffic Control ordered the JAL to fly directly to Torkitna, which was a reporting point en route before going to Anchorage. The co-pilot agreed to this request, and the plane had to rotate left in order to continue on its course. Just after this maneuver, a strange phenomena began to occur. Later, the captain would describe what the crew at first thought were two sets of aircraft lights at about 30 degrees front left and about 2,000 feet below their position. The lights were moving in the same direction and at the same speed as the JAL. The Air Force bases of both Eelson and Elmsdorf were nearby, and thinking that the lights belonged to a military aircraft, the crew initially ignored them. But after a few minutes, they realized that the lights were not changing position. Suddenly, the JAL started to shudder. At 17.18 p.m., the two UFOs quickly swerved in front of the aircraft, one above the other. This caused their lights to become so intensely bright that the crew could feel the heat from them on their faces. The UFOs would speed up, then stop, then mirror the speed of the aircraft, and then begin the erratic display over again. The objects moved with amazing agility, leaping about and covering miles in only seconds. It was as if they were defying the laws of physics. Captain Tarashi later described these two objects 
as being square in shape and as having several exhaust pipes. The exhausts were arranged in two rows and the lights were amber and white, shooting out of them like flames coming out of separate rockets. He said that the lights were so incredibly bright, when the exhaust was thrusting, it was blinding, but once the recoil blast had ended, each port could be seen individually, and the speed of the UFO became steady. Co-pilot Tame Fuji said that they were orange and white and looked like Christmas lights. The flight engineer described them as undulating clusters. The central body of each object seemed to emit an occasional jet from left to right and back again. Now alarmed, the crew decided to ask traffic control if they had any idea what was happening. The two UFOs were still to the front and left of the JAL and flying one above the other. At 17.19 p.m. Alaska Standard Time, Tame Fuji radio to Anchorage Center. Now the crew watched as the two unknown objects changed position and moved from one above the other into a horizontal line. They were now at slightly higher altitude to the JAL and about 49 degrees to the left. It was at this point that the captain asked the flight engineer to get his camera out of the bag behind his seat because he wanted to photograph the strange phenomena. Taking out his camera, Terochi tried to capture the incident on film, but the autofocus on his camera would not work. He changed to manual focus, but the shutter lens would not close. Then the JAL began to shake, so he quickly gave up and put the camera away. Anchorage Control radioed the Military Regional Operations Command Center and asked them to confirm that there were no known military aircraft in the area. The command center confirmed this. At approximately 17.23 p.m., the two unidentified objects suddenly left the plane and flew towards the eastern horizon. Tame Fuji radioed in to say that the traffic was extinguished. We cannot see it now, he said. The two objects had moved further away from the plane, but now the captain could see a pale, white, flat light moving along with them. It was to the left, traveling in the same direction, at the same speed and same altitude as the JAL, and he could see that the light was part of some sort of huge shape. It gave him the impression that the two smaller craft had traveled back to some sort of mothership. The object could also be seen as a green blip on the plane's radar. It appeared like any other radar traffic, only much larger. Air traffic control asked again if the plane still had visual contact with the traffic, to which Tame Fuji replied, Strangely, Anchorage control had picked up a hit on their radar too but it was five miles behind the position of the JAL. Now the pale white lights moved closer to the left of the plane again and disappeared from their radar screen. At approximately 17.21 p.m., Anchorage Control could see the anomaly on their radar and asked military command if they were seeing the same thing. They confirmed that there was a blip on their radar about eight miles in front of the JAL. Whatever was up there with the plane had no transponder which would have identified it to the ground stations. Terachi set the onboard radar scope to within a 25 mile radius and confirmed that there was an object at about seven and a half miles distance. The crew were now afraid of a collision with the object, so a panicked Tame Fuji radioed in to request that they change course by turning 40 degrees to the right to avoid it. He told air traffic control that whatever was up there with them was very big. Later, Terochi would describe it as being twice as large as an aircraft carrier. Permission was given and the plane banked right. Because of their terror, the captain would later say it felt like a long time before clearance was given for the maneuver, when it was really only 15 seconds. Unfortunately, the UFO continued to follow them. Tame Fuji asked for a change of altitude from 35,000 feet to 31,000 feet to try and avoid hitting whatever was in front of them. Anchorage Control replied. It 
It was still with them and ascending in formation with them. Traffic control then told the captain to perform a 360 degree turn to see if the UFO followed. After confirming on Grand Radar that there was an unidentified craft flying with them, military control asked if Tarachi wanted them to scramble on the UFO. Tarachi was aware of the Mantle incident and the fate of Captain Thomas Mantle, who had died when his P-51 Mustang fighter plane had crashed in Franklin, Kentucky. At the time, Mantle had been sent in pursuit of a UFO and blacked out because of the high altitude. Worried about what the outcome might be, Tarachi refused this offer, replying. Air traffic control advised that the plane should make a right turn 360 degrees and advise me what your traffic does then. The captain switched to manual mode and turned the jumbo jet before checking the rear of the plane, only to find that the object was still there. It was at this point that a United Airlines passenger aircraft began its scheduled flight from Anchorage to Fairbanks. This meant that it was flying in the same air zone as the JAL. The UA aircraft came close by and requested that both planes should flash their landing lights to confirm their positions. The UA plane approached, and it was then that the spaceship finally disappeared. And Japan Airlines 1628 was able to land safely at Anchorage Airport at 6.20 p.m. The whole incident ended 75 miles north of Tolkitna and 150 miles from Anchorage. It lasted for 50 minutes. Throughout this time, communication was extremely patchy, there was a lot of static, and at times neither the crew of the JAL or ground control could tell what the other was saying. Once the unidentified object had disappeared, the static cleared, and communication became trouble-free. So what was it that the crew of JAL 1628 really saw? According to protocol, the crew were immediately interviewed by a Federal Aviation Administration official and two agents. This resulted in a short and incomplete initial report, and the interviews were not recorded, although the statements given by the crew and the drawings made by the captain did support later more detailed testimony. On the 29th of December 1986, a Tokyo news agency picked up a news story about a Japanese Airlines crew that had seen a UFO above the skies of Alaska. They interviewed Captain Tarachi and then contacted Paul Stook, who was the public information officer at the FAA in Anchorage, in order to confirm the information. United Press International broke the story in the US and the FAA had no choice but to investigate this sighting more thoroughly. They reopened their inquiry at the start of January 1987 and Tarachi was re-interviewed on the 2nd of January. His co-pilot and flight engineer were questioned separately later. By now, the press were following the story with great interest, because the FAA did not have an accurate picture of the events. Much of the earlier information that was released through Mr. Stook was incorrect. Later transcripts of Anchorage traffic control tapes were made, and the radar data was analyzed. The FAA formally released a statement, which was read by Paul Stook three months later on March 5th, 1987 announcing that although there may have been earlier suggestions confirming a UFO sighting, this was a mistake. He stated that the blip on the ground radar was an anomaly that had appeared because of a split radar image. It was really just down to bad timing, he said. Stuke did, however, acknowledge that there was not enough evidence to either confirm or deny that the crew had experienced something, although the FAA could not confirm what it was that they may have seen. He added, that my agency does not have the resources or the congressional mandate to investigate sightings of unidentified flying objects. We have not tried to determine what the crew of Japan Airlines Flight 1628 saw based on scientific analysis of the stars, planets, magnetic fields, angle of view, etc. The media accepted the FAA explanation and interest in the case died. NBC even incorrectly reported that the co-pilot and flight engineer were not sure if they had seen a UFO at all and that the FAA had found nothing to verify the captain's story. To the public, it seemed that an experienced crew had just made a mistake and failed to identify normal flight occurrences. Unwilling to wait for the FAA investigation to reach a conclusion, the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, who are known as CSI-COP, did their own analysis of the event. 
They published a press release at the end of January, where they claimed to have solved the mystery. According to them, Captain Tarashi had mistaken the planets Jupiter and Mars for the UFO sighting, describing how the planets would have been just above the horizon at the time of the event. But CSICOP were wrong about the timing of the incident. It actually happened an hour earlier than they stated, and as they did not have access to any of the tracking data, it was impossible for them to know either the direction or the location of the JAL at any given time. Their report only fueled the media into calling out Tarachi as a liar and an incompetent. The later FAA report vindicated the captain in so much as his crew members collaborated the radar detecting an unknown object. But the damage to his reputation was already done and by this point he had been grounded as a pilot and given desk duties. It would seem that if you are a pilot and you report any sort of unusual sighting to the FAA, then you are more or less guaranteed to lose your license. Neither the FAA, the military, or even the civil aviation authorities are interested in hearing about UFOs. It wasn't until 2001 that James Callaghan became the whistleblower and defended the statements of the crew. Callaghan was an FAA divisional chief for accidents and incidents at the time of the JAL sighting. He organized a press conference where he explained his involvement in the case. He said that he was contacted by Anchorage FAA at the beginning of the inquiry because they were under a great deal of pressure from the press and needed to know what to tell the media. He was not even aware that such an event had occurred. Nothing had been reported to him and initially he thought it was probably just another stealth bomber that had been spotted. Any unusual sightings he had investigated had usually turned out to be experimental flights or whatever was in development at the time. Callaghan was determined to create a complete and thorough report of the encounter by gathering all the data involved, so he asked for any and all records of the incident to be sent to the technical center in Atlantic City. It was the first time that there were several minutes of radar data from multiple sources that could be analyzed by scientists. Callaghan took his radar data and synchronized it with the voice tapes. By looking at the transponder return from Japan Airlines 1628, it was clear to him that there was a solid object following the aircraft. It was definitely dense and not some form of weather pattern. It intermittently appeared and disappeared, and it traveled faster than the JAL. Knowing that there were no known aircraft capable of making those kind of maneuvers, Callaghan was convinced that it must be some sort of UFO. Believing that the evidence would prove this, he was keen to release his findings to the public. A day later, Callaghan presented the evidence to Vice Admiral Egan, who was the administrator at the FAA at the time. He watched the whole video and asked Callaghan not to discuss his findings with anyone until he had set up a government meeting for the following day. That meeting was attended by members of the military, three FBI and three CIA operatives, as well as three scientific officers from the President Reagan's study team. After watching the video and listening to the tapes three times, the hearing was suddenly brought to a close. One of the CIA men confiscated all of the data available, including the printouts, voice tapes and videos. He then told everyone attending that they were sworn to secrecy. He said that the meeting had never happened because the incident had never happened. Callaghan challenged this by asking why. He was told that it was the first time there had been recorded radar data on a UFO and that the public could not be made aware of this because they would panic. Callaghan had to do as his superiors ordered, but he managed to keep the original copy of the video, the target printouts, the pilot's report, and the FAA's first report, which stated that Captain Tarachi had referred to the object as a UFO. After his retirement, Callaghan produced all of this evidence at a 2001 press conference. James Derry, who was one of the FAA agents and had interviewed the crew initially after the incident, also came forward to defend them. He didn't believe that the men were hallucinating. Derry noticed that the first officer and the flight engineer were suffering from signs of shock. He also found that the captain was lucid and decisive in his descriptions of the event, even though he was breathing and talking fast. The captain made drawings of the objects, including what he called the mothership, showing its disc-like shape and size comparable to that of the JAL. Terachi was adamant that the UFOs had complete control over their own gravity and that the technology used was unconceivable. 
Derry deduced that the three men were not making their close encounter up, and whatever had happened during their flight had scared the life out of them. Only two months after the JAL incident, a similar event happened over the skies of Alaska, although this one involves a US Air Force plane. The KC-135 Stratotanker was flying to Ailson Air Force Base in Anchorage when the pilot radioed in. The pilot reported seeing a huge disc-like object that was very similar to the one described by Captain Tarashi, and it was flying very close to his plane. Once he had landed safely at Ailson Air Force Base, the pilot was told to contact the FAA office immediately. Just one day later, Alaska Airline Flight 53 experienced a close encounter when they noticed a gigantic saucer-shaped object following their course. It was not visible on ground radar, but the plane picked it up as a blip on theirs. The pilot was alarmed at how fast it was moving and radioed in. So in closing, the question is, have we been visited by extraterrestrial life? We'll leave that for you to decide. <laughs>